Mark, the 10th chapter, starting with verse 35 and going through 39. It's a story you don't normally compare, you read it, communion time, but I want to read it this morning. It says, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said unto them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said unto him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said unto them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And to be baptized with the baptism which, with which I am baptized. And they said unto him, We are able. And Jesus said unto them, The cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left, that is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Basically, the story behind this passage is Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. It's the last trip he's making to Jerusalem. He knows when he gets there, he will eventually be arrested and will be crucified. But the apostles almost were oblivious. He was telling them outright that that's what was going to happen, but they didn't believe it. They were busy with other things. He talked about his betrayal and arrest. He told them he was going to be scourged and, and put to death. And none of them really understood it. Uh, he also was teaching them about his resurrection. But obviously they didn't understand that either. But the sons of thunder, as they were known, that was Jesus' nickname for uh, James and John, was the sons of thunder. Uh, they came to him with this request. Uh, actually, according to other accounts, if you put them together, his, their mother was the one that that put him up to it and ask him to do that. And we're going to talk about that later on in the sermon a little bit. But they wanted to sit one on his right hand and one on his left in the kingdom. In other words, they wanted to sit next to him in authority. Uh, but I want you to think about Jesus' response to this request. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. And they answered, yes, we'll, we'll do, we can do that. We can do whatever you want us to. And their minds were on the future kingdom and not what was happening today. They refused to understand what lay ahead. Jesus was speaking literally of the cup of hatred that would eventually lead to him shedding his blood on the cross. And he was asking them, can you do that? Can you follow me in doing that? Uh, by the way, that is a common Jewish metaphor that speaks of the divine judgment on sin. And Jesus was taking on him the weight of mankind's sin as he hung on the cross. Uh, I think that's why his heart broke and it came out water and blood. His heart literally broke on the cross as he took on the weight of our sin on himself. And he's asking him, can you do that? Can you do that? His baptism would be a baptism of death. And it's a similar thought. The idea of being underwater was an Old Testament picture of being overwhelmed by calamity. And so truly uh, they did. Actually, Jesus said, you will do the same thing. And truly they did. We're going to see part of that later to, in the sermon today. But Jesus was using these as types or pictures of them having to share in his suffering and death. Although they would eventually share in his suffering for the sake of the cross, yet what they shared was not a redemptive type of, of death. But he said, it's not me to determine your place in the kingdom. That wasn't mine to give. That's God's. But these two things that he mentions have become the two main ordinances of the church, or the laws of the church. But I sometimes wonder if we really understand the importance of we, what we are saying when we participate in the ordinances. And I'm wondering if Jesus asked us the same thing today that he asked those two apostles, if we could answer in the affirmative. Uh, 
In baptism, we are entering into his death. Romans 6, 3 says all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, have been baptized into his death. And that means we have been called to follow him, uh, to do whatever he asks us to do. Romans 6, 5 says if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, I like that word united because the idea of being unified is part of being in the same family. We are joining the family of Jesus Christ when we become one with him in baptism. Uh, but we become one in sharing everything, not just the good, but also the bad. Uh, you know, when you we're studying the life of the apostles, and if you look at the apostles, you wonder, well, why was this person... Why didn't they suffer the way this person suffered? And it's just, that's the way it is. And we can't question those types of things. He says, can you drink of the cup? And Jesus used it for them in the sense of dying for the cause, just as he was dying. We may not understand those, but those who are in the persecuted church worldwide certainly do understand what it means today to die for your witness of Jesus Christ. And every day, every day, hour after hour, Christians are persecuted and killed across our world. When we partake of the cup, we are not only acknowledging our sin, but we are acknowledging and saying we are willing to die for Jesus if, so, if necessary. Uh, we are willing to suffer the way he did. And basically, I think the challenge that Jesus lays before the apostles is being faithful no matter what they may face, until the very end. And then God will determine our status in the kingdom. That's not up for us to decide. But in the meantime, we can't live like everybody else. Like James and John, we have been called by Jesus Christ. This is first, or 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It says, therefore, come out from their midst and be ye separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Too often we become so entranced in living like the rest of the world that we don't remember that our lives today, that we live as Christians, will determine what's going to happen to us in the future. Jesus gave us some of these ordinances to bring us to him, but also to remind us of our responsibility to live faithful before him, that we at one day we might reign and rule with him. When we come to the communion emblems, we are coming to things that remind us, emblems that remind us that Jesus Christ gave himself for us. And he wants us to be faithful in the willingness to give our lives each day to him in service. And that's what he's asking. And I think that's why it's important at times when we come to the communion to sit back and to reflect for a little bit on our lives how we're doing, you know. I've been serving the Lord for 55, 60 years. And I still, you know, every day I see things that I have been a failure in. As I pray and examine my own life. And I think it's important that we do that when we come to these emblems. That we don't come kind of passing them off as just something that we do. But it's something that really causes us to reflect on Jesus what he suffered and went through as he went to the cross for us. So let's take a few moments just of silent reflection and prayer as we prepare our hearts and our minds to take of these emblems. Father, we thank you for the fact that even though mankind has failed you years, year in and year out, from the very beginning, that still you have loved your creation so very much that you from the beginning had a plan, a plan to save the world and to 
reconcile people to you through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just thank you for him and in his willingness to go to the cross and to suffer and die there for us. And Father, we just pray that you might help us as we partake of these emblems this morning to be drawn into fellowship with you and be drawn to the foot of the cross again to contemplate what your son has done for us. We ask these things in his name. Amen. As he instituted communion service, the first thing that Jesus did was he took the bread and explained it was a symbol of his body that was pure and holy that was given for us. So let us give thanks for this emblem. Father, we thank you for this emblem that Jesus gave to us to remind us of the spiritual hunger that we need to have for him and his ways, for your ways, the things that you taught him from the time he was born on. And Father, we thank you for the fact that this unleavened bread represents the holiness and purity of his life that he laid down for us as a sacrifice. Father, we pray that as we partake of these emblems this morning, that you might just bless them and bless us, that we might be drawn to you and to your son, as we are reminded of what he's done for us. We pray these things in his name.